Got it. Hello, everybody. We're going to be going live in just a minute as people come into the room. Flip it around if you can. Okay. Say hi to everybody as we welcome everybody into the room and see oh, if no, um, no. Okay. let us know where you're from. And we'll just wait a couple minutes as everybody comes in and and, mm -hmm. and finds it. I see a lot of people have already popped in. Janine's watching for questions. You guys can put in if you want the mystery box. You can start putting that in there. Hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's got weather as nice as we do here in in Wisconsin. I I, I know it's going to get cold again. We're probably going to get more snow, but we're enjoying it while it lasts. And all of our people down in the south who've had um, issues with the weather. All right, I got to check something on Janine's <laughs> computer. Sorry, here. Janine's computer literate. Like, I don't know how you go. I guess if you click on it. Yeah. I know, but oh, like, I see. for... Click. Sure. Check over here. I don't know why that's happening again. Why don't you log in okay. as yourself? <laughs> I can just do it here. All right. Last week we had some some issues with Janine not being able to see the comments, and so this week we've got two computers set up, and it's happening on her computer, and I can see it. I can see the comments coming in on mine. So no, log in on that computer, log out, and log in as me or as yourself. Okay, and I can try to. Um, Otherwise, flip your screen around and I'll turn mine so that you can see the comments on, on mine. All right, looks like we got a, a good group in here. Welcome, everybody. Um, tonight, we're going to be working. Um, I'm going to show you guys how to use stencils. And there's lots of different methods for doing the stencils. Um, I'm going to show you using sponge rollers. I'm going to show you using thickening colors. I'll tell you some things that I find don't work very well. We'll stencil with uh, some dimensional color as well. And um, so we're going to get started here. Um, for those of you that are new, um, you can put comments in, and Janine will watch for those. And she'll try to catch me um, with the questions. If we get people coming in late, it's, it's kind of been um, in the past where we get some people in really late coming in, and they start asking questions about stuff that was covered in the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 40 minutes, 50 minutes. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of ask people to go back and watch the recording. Last week, it got dragged out really long because I had to keep repeating a lot of stuff. So I'm not trying to be rude. Um, if any of you see somebody asking something that's been covered, um, if you wouldn't mind even commenting and saying, oh, he covered that, you know, in the beginning, go back, back and watch the recording. Um, I would appreciate that. Uh, we don't want to be nasty or mean to anybody, but um, I don't want to drag this out to hours and hours. So um, we're going to get started. If the mystery box, um, tonight we're back to the one mystery box, and you can put comments in there for mystery box. And we're to prevent people from coming in really late and having to keep adding to it, um, we're going to limit it to the first 50 people that say mystery box. And Janine's going to mark those names down. She's going to throw them in a bowl. And the way it works, for those of you who haven't done the mystery box, is we will draw one name out of that bowl toward the end tonight. And that person will have the opportunity to purchase the mystery box. The contents of the box is a mystery. Um, I usually give some hints. And the hint that I'm going to give about the mystery box tonight is it's focused on new products. Um, and some of you have been in the past and seen some of those mystery boxes, and you know that it's it's new items that we're introducing. Um, and so the person will have the opportunity to purchase that box um, for $35 plus 15 for shipping. So it's $50 for the box. 
and there's usually over $100 worth of materials in that box. Now, if somebody gets it, and then I open it and I reveal what they got, and they don't like it or don't have a use for it, we will gladly draw another name out and let the next person have that box. So don't feel like you're going to be stuck with it and with something that you don't need. All right? So this is the mystery box. We're going to set that aside here, and we will go back to that a little bit later. I'm going to flip the camera down now so that you guys can see what we're going to be working on here and some of the samples that I showed and and these are really hard to show in the lighting with the glare of the lighting but I did um, Mako Spectacler Stardust on here and so it's got a real glittery sparkly finish this is using one of the new the Daisy stencil I'm going to show you how to do multiple colors in the background like this we've got these that are all new stencil designs um, did the same thing on here with the Spectaclear. One of the things that I tried and I've had people asking is, what if I get the Spectaclear on too heavy? And it's basically a clear glaze with a, a speckle in it that gives that metallic speck. I put three coats on here and you can see that it gets a little milky looking over the top of the black. Spectaclear works best on dark colors, blues, browns, blacks, anything deep in color, it will show up like a, a sparkly glitter. If you use it over light colors, it turns out to be um, kind of just a dark spot on there and it's not real attractive. It's not sparkly on light or pastel colors. So we're gonna show you and talk about that. And then I've got this big giant bowl here. This is doing multiple colors in the background as well and using the stencils over the top. Let me set these aside. I've got a plate out here and um, we're going to start out just doing some colors in the background. So I've got a tile here. I'm going to be working on this one with Mako Stroke and Coat colors. You can use products like um, Duncan Concepts will work. Um, one of the other pieces we're going to do, we're going to use um, colors for earth concentrates. And I'll talk to you about the differences between these products. So I'm putting out some sun kiss some Caribbean blue, we're going to do a little cantaloupe, and we're going to do some pinky swear. And you don't have to do multiple colors in the background. You can create um, your backgrounds just using um, one color. Um, I've done techniques like this for those of you that were in my banding live. We did a banding on plates. If you band your background color on, you can do stencils over the top of that as well. It's kind of fun. Um, I'm going to use kind of a larger soft fan brush, and I'm going to thin these colors with a little bit of water. So I'm just going to slide this over so you guys can see my palette here. I'm just picking up a little bit of water with a fan brush, and I'm just going to thin this yellow. I want this background to be kind of a watercolor consistency. Now, Mako Stroke and Coat is what's called a frit-based product. So it's made with basically finely ground glass frit. So when this is fired, when you put three coats of it on, you get a shiny glaze, a shiny surface. If you do two coats, you get kind of a streaky looking, maybe a little bit rough feeling, but some shine. And then if you do one coat, you get a really translucent effect. And so we're thinning this with water. And I'm just going to go and kind of randomly do some spots of the yellow. And so I want it to be thin and trans, trans, translucent. So I, I'm going to continue to add some water to it to thin that color. I'm not being real particular with this. Um, tonight I'm working on a stoneware platter. You can do this on earthenware. You can do it on stoneware. I'm not worried about washing the brush when I go to the next color. I usually start with the lightest and then work into the darker. And I'm just kind of brushing this on like watercolor so that it's kind of wet into wet and I get a little bit of a blend of a color. Now, most of this is going to be covered with stencil, so I'm not too worried about um, if these colors aren't blended really well. Add some, adding some pink, and then I'm going to go into the blue. And I can go back with water over the top of this 
if I want to blend it even more. And in addition to brushing on like this, I can also take and kind of stipple the color on with the fan brush. So I'm, I'm holding the brush kind of straight up and down, and I'm turning it like this as I tap that brush down if I want the color to be a little bit more concentrated and just go kind of wet into wet, dabbing those colors and not being real particular about how they come out on here. I just want to have some type of color in the background so that where the stencils um, cover those um, colors will show through in those areas. So you can do a dabbing method like this. You can do a, a brushing, kind of blending watercolor. If I don't like the way it looks, I can go with a little bit of water over the top of it, and I can blend those colors out a little bit more, and I can always put some more color on top. Now, with this thin of an application of stroke and coat, you're not going to have real solid coverage, and it's not going to be shiny. If I put this in the kiln and I fired it, I would see these colors, they'd get a little bit brighter, um, but they would definitely not be shiny. I want to let this dry for a little bit, and while we wait for that to dry, I'm going to um, take this, <clears throat> um, I've got a small stone here and a large stone, and I want to get the background colors on these. The small stone, I'm going to show you using sculpting medium, how we create dimensional effects, and on this rock, I want to do kind of a, a sunset background. So I'm pushing the, the stroke and coat aside, and I've got Paula McCoy's colors for earth colors out here. And so I've got um, Florida orange. I've got um, this yellow, the CC 121, the orange is 116. I've got this bright violet, which is CC 137. And I've got... Um, the peacock blue, which is CC 153. And we're going to create kind of a, a, a blend of color, kind of like a sunset background on this piece. So I'm going to grab another tile here. Now, the difference between colors for earth concentrates, oops, I, got a, I forgot to shake it. You always want to shake these. They're kind of a gel-based color, and so they may appear really thick, but as you shake them, the more you shake them, the more fluid they will become. And I've got and, and they go a long, long way, too. So a little bit of color goes a long way with these, so I'm not squeezing out real big puddles. Someone wants to know when you're dry brushing. Dry brushing, when I'll do dry brushing? I'll probably be doing that um, either later this month or in... Um, April sometime. I've had a lot of requests to, to do dry brushing. If you haven't um, caught, Brenda Bartz also does um, live events on Thursday nights. She's got the, the bisque boxes that she sends out, and she does a lot of dry brushing as well if you want to get some of the basics on that. And I'll try to do something a little bit different than maybe what Brenda um, does on her pieces. So I've got this bisque rock. This too is um, earthenware. And I'm going to thin these colors down. So color concentrates are basically pigment. And they're, they're really concentrated. There's, they're not clay-based. There are underglazes that have clay in them as well. These are basically, I always describe them as raw pigment um, in liquid form. So they're really concentrated. They're designed for brush strokes. They're designed for washes. They're designed for outlining and types of design work. They're not designed for brushing. If I wanted this whole stone to be yellow, um, if I thin it down, I could brush a coat over the top to create a wash. But I don't want to try to brush multiple coats on here because what can happen is um, those colors can peel back either in firing or as they're drying. So don't try to do solid coverage of large areas using the CC colors. Do we have to use... Um, Paula's clear over her products. No, other clear glazes will work on there. Sometimes some of the brands, even Mako, sometimes their purples and things can be a little bit sensitive to certain clear glazes. Um, there are clear glazes, they talk about 
tin-based clear glazes and things. Um, and if you have any concerns about that, just shoot me a message and I can contact Paula or some of you are friends with Paula. You can ask her questions like that as well. And can you say Brenda's last name? Brenda Bartz. Yeah, um, it's, yeah it's Brenda's brush, brush Strokes and Bisque. She's in Shano. She's she less than an hour. Than she is, yep. She's less than an hour away from me. So I'm brushing the yellow on the bottom and then I just dipped into water and I'm brushing water up into the next area where I'm going to go with the orange. I'm going to thin the orange a little bit using that same brush. I'm going to start up a little bit higher and I'm going to work my way back into the yellow to get a blend. And I really thinned that out here so I'm going to add a little bit more and I'm going to pull that kind of wet into wet into the yellow so that I get a gradual blend from yellow to orange. Then I'm going to go with water again. And the reason I go with water is I want to really dampen the bisque so that I get a better blend of color. I'm going to pick up a little bit of this peacock blue, again, thinning that with water. And I'm going to brush that wet into wet into the orange to get that kind of blend. And then I'm going to brush water on the top. And I'm going to pick up a little bit of the purple. And look at how little of that color I've used. What a, what a color waster I am to to put that. I didn't think I had a lot of extra color out there, but clearly I did. So now I've got kind of a blend from yellow to orange to blue to purple on here. Um, these colors will not fire out shiny if I put three coats on, which I don't recommend. Um, they will not fire out glossy because they're basically just pigment. They are not a frit based product like the stroke and coat is. So we're going to set this aside to dry. We're going to use the, the um, forest stencil on that one. And then this rock, I'm just going to do a solid um, black on the background of this one. And the only reason I'm doing that is so that the color shows up really well um, because the sculpting medium is white. And so I want that to show up well. I'm actually just going to squeeze the color right on here. I'm going to take another soft fan brush and I'm going to apply this over the background. I'm going to go back after and I'll wipe away around the rock edge on here. I'll wipe some of that back to bring out the highlights. Now generally, like I said, stroke and coat, you would do three coats to get solid coverage. So we'll let this first coat dry. Um, we'll add another coat. I've actually found a lot of times with the stroke and coat, I can get away with two coats on the black because it's it's so dark and such an intense color um, but if you want to for sure have solid coverage you want to do three coats of that so we're going to set that aside to dry and the nice thing with all of these colors is they do dry quickly so this plate that i did just a few minutes ago is actually all set to go i'm going to set these tiles i'm actually going to wash off the stroke and coat here because we're done with that dry off that tile because we're going to use that to mix our next color. And so the next color that we're going to work with is um, the Mako Stroke and Coat again. We're going to use their Tuxedo Black. So I'm going to squeeze a puddle of this out on my palette. Now, a common mistake that a lot of people make with stencils, and, and when I first started out using stencils, I was using the sponge dabbers where it's the stick with the, the sponge on the end and you kind of pounce the, the color on the stencil. Uh, people have used sponges and they load that with color and they pounce. And what I found in workshops is a lot of people tend to press too hard and it forces the color to bleed under the stencil. So one of the products that I, I found works really well is the Mako silkscreen medium and it's basically a thickener and they use it with the silkscreen designs to um, to thicken the color to rub over the top of the silkscreen and I found with the stencils that that actually works really well too because with these really intricate designs with some of these stencils um, if you go with the sponge and you dab it on, there's a really good chance you're going to get the color is going to bleed under. 
So I use the silkscreen medium, which is their AC310, and I mix that with the stroking coat, and that will thicken it. Now, a little bit of this, it's just a, a white powder. Um, I'm not doing drugs here, I'm not, um, but I'm gonna just sprinkle this, a little bit of it over the top of the black stroking coat, and then I'm gonna take the palette knife, and I'm going to blend that silk screen medium in, and really mix it. And a lot of times people think they get to this point and, and the color is still kind of fluid, but it's kind of lumpy. And so I always tell them, don't add more medium, mix it for a couple of minutes, because once you really get that worked in there, you're, if you're, you're gonna have the color will be nice and thick. You can always add more silk screen medium, but if you add too much too quickly, it basically turns into like cement. So you wanna really work that and get that in there, mix that color well. And I always say what I look for is the consistency of like peanut butter or toothpaste. And I also look at how shiny it is. And so if I see really wet, glossy, like freshly squeezed out color, if I squeeze out a puddle of color next to this, you might be able to see in the camera the difference. And in workshops, I always end up walking around the room and try to look at everybody's color to see before anybody starts the next step. I don't tell them the next step, but you can see how shiny and fluid that is and how thick and pasty this is. And so that's what I look for is that the real shiny wet look is gone and that it's the consistency of peanut butter or toothpaste. And then I just kind of scrape it all into a pile. And I'm just gonna do one of these stencils in the middle of this plate. So, and I, I purposely picked this rounded platter that, that's kind of a coop shape so that I can show you doing this up on the edge as long as on a flat surface. Because stencils on a flat surface are always really easy to do. Um, but when you get something that has a curve to it or a, a round shape and you're trying to do that stencil around the outside, you want to really check out your stencil and you want to bend it like this. If you're going to go on the outside of a vase, or let's say I was doing this on the outside of this bottle, if I take this stencil and I wrap it around on here, some stencils, there will be parts that will go boing and they'll stick out straight like this all over the place. And you have to really be careful with those because they can be challenging. Right here, this one, a little bit of this kind of is sticking out on here. I can work with that. Um, and, and hold that down as I do it. So flat surfaces, anytime you can find something that's fairly flat, it's easy. If you go on a rounded surface like this, wrap the stencil around and see how many areas stick way out because everywhere that it sticks out, you've got to be able to hold that down and work your way around on that surface. Someone asked a while back if you have handheld extruders. So. Um, we are, uh, the, the handheld extruders, that's a good question. We are sold out on them. We've got some shipments coming in. Um, you can order them, but <clears throat> at this point, they won't be available probably until the end of the month if they're ordered now. All right, so the, the trick here is holding the stencil down, placing it, and once you start, and I just use my finger with the silk screen medium, and I pick some of this up, and I, I kind of use my index finger and my thumb to kind of hold the stencil down. And then I go over and I rub kind of in a circular motion. And once I get a little area done, that stencil will, will stay down pretty well. And um, it, it makes it really easy because it's not slipping and sliding. But when you first do it, you have to be careful. And every time I move to a new area, I kind of, again, my thumb and my index finger kind of holding that stencil down. I don't want to over rub this because if I, if I rub and I'm not pressing real hard, I'm just pressing hard enough that the color and I'm going in a circular motion so that it fills in all of these little openings. I'm also going outside of the stencil and I usually kind of rub the color away instead of in toward it. The more you rub in toward it, the more likely it is that you're going to have color bleeding underneath. And I'm not going out very far from the outside because I'm going to add another stencil up on the side here, so I don't want to go out too far. 
This was a while ago too, but what is the product that looks like clear with glitter? Why is that a lady with a Chris, with Christmas trees uses? That's the 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 Spectaclear, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that okay. um, as we go. That's what I used on on these pieces, and I'll show you some other pieces that that mm -hmm. have it on as well. And we've got those in in pints and in four ounce. And all of the items that I'm I'm working with tonight are available on my website, learnfiredarts.com. Someone said that the camera is pulsing and having trouble focusing on the... Yeah, and I have the camera set to not autofocus, and this is kind of a Facebook thing, and I've, I've kind of noticed on my screen, too, that it's doing that, and I apologize, but I there's nothing that I can do. We had that one other week that that, that did that as well, so sorry about that. How long does the silk screen media mixed with the underlay stay viable to you? That's a good question. How long does this color that I've thickened, how long can I keep that um, before it dries up? So if you have a little cup with a tight lid on it, an old paint bottle or something that you can put it in, um, that color can last a long time. If it gets too thick, you can always add some more of the color to it to thin it down. And I, I should have mentioned that too when I was thickening the color if it did get too thick um, you can just add some more color to it to make it a little bit more fluid just squeeze a little more color on and and soften it a couple of people are asking about application why not using a roller or is, is it easier to spread with a spatula um, we're gonna I'm gonna show you the spatula technique and I'm gonna show you the rollers as well on this type of a stencil that has such tiny little details I find with the sponge roller that even with that sponge roller, the color will tend to bleed under because you're you're kind of rolling and, and working that color back and forth on there. And the spatula I'm going to use um, to use the sculpting medium to make a dimensional effect, and I'll show you that method. If I just use the spatula or the, the palette knife and just rub the, the color over the top of this without thickening it, um, it would definitely bleed under if, if I didn't thicken the color. I find that the thickened color works much better with the stencils, with these intricate designs, than um, using color that hasn't been, been thickened. And, and if I use that spatula over this, this design, there's a good chance that I'm going to kind of catch some of the little edges and force the color underneath where I don't want that to be. What cone will you fire at? This particular piece happens to be stone mer, so this is going to go in at like a cone five, cone six. But if I'm using um, earthenware, it's going to be like an O6 firing. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to mix up a little bit more of this, this color here. So I think I was explaining about the... I don't know if I finished explaining, sorry, about the color, how long it will last. Put it in a, a cup that's airtight, and, and it should last a long, long time. I purposely put more of the silkscreen medium in here. I want to show you guys how lumpy and thick. A lot of times on the back of the palette knife, it'll just kind of really gum up on there, and it's like cement, and I'm pushing as hard as I can here to get that off of there. And and this is like really super, super lumpy. And that's what happens when you put too much in there. So if that happens, just add a little bit more color and mix it in. And that'll soften it right up. Avoid using water um, because that can dilute the color. Um, so usually Adding more color if you get too much silk screen medium in there is better than um, adding water. So I want to add another stencil. And here I'm going to have the stencil going off the edge a little bit. And so I'm just going to start again my, my index finger. And so because this is rounded, I want to kind of hold this down. And as I start to put that color on, and sometimes you'll get some color, even when you thicken it, you can get a little bit of color that bleeds under. And I'm going to show you what I do to disguise when um, I do get some color that bleeds under. It's a real easy way to, to fix that.
At what point of dampness or dryness do you remove the stencil? So the reason I didn't remove this first stencil is because I'm going to show you with a sponge roller or with a brush how we fill in the rest of the black around here. I don't want to sit here and have to make enough thickened color to cover mm -hmm. this whole piece. So um, you generally want to try and get the stencil removed before the color is completely dry because if you wait until the color is completely dry, you will run into um, some chipping sometimes as you lift that stencil. And then what's the difference between a stencil and a silk screen? And when would you use one versus the other? So a silk screen is, if you're familiar with like mm -hmm. the silk screening process that they do on shirts and sweatshirts and things, it's a, a fine screen that has an area on it that is basically blocked out. Um, and so where the bare screen is in the design, when you rub this color over the top, the color goes through the screen. And um, with a stencil, there's no screen here. This is just a, a plastic cutout stencil design um, that you're, you're forcing the color through. And so with silk screens, you can get some really super duper intricate designs with a silk screen versus a stencil. Um, things like um, it, what it's really good, what's, what silk screens are really good with is if you're doing um, words and lettering and things because you can get really nice crisp lines with a silk screen. And there's lots of cool silk screens out on the market. Mako has a lot of them. Paula McCoy has a bunch. Biscuit Imports has a bunch. Can you do this on glass? You can do this on glass. I have taught this as a, a glass workshop as well. One of your girlfriends message. Oh, <laughs> I got a friend request earlier, and as I was getting ready to, yeah, when I was getting ready to open this up, I kept getting messages from from Tessa or whatever her name is, and she's like, "How are you?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I know what you're gonna try to offer me. It's amazing the the things on Facebook that people will do and say." And... All right. Can oh, can you use a thickener with acrylics? Use the thickener with acrylics. You can. The thickener will work with acrylics. Um, I kind of avoid it because picture using your finger and rubbing, um, you might want to wear gloves or something. I mean, it'll wash off, but um, it is a little bit messier working with acrylics. But yeah, the, it will thicken acrylics as well. So I'm going to be working with a sponge roller. And so these sponge rollers come in a pack of three, again, available at learnfiredarts.com. And... Um, I'm going to be using the larger one. You can use any size for this, but I'm going to use this to, to do the stencil in a little bit as well. So what I want to do is I'm loading this roller is I'm going to drag it back and forth through the color. And I don't want the sponge roller to have big wet drips of color. And I don't necessarily want bare areas where there isn't any color. For the part that I'm going to do now, it's not a big deal. But when I show you in the next piece how we're going to use it over the stencil, um, it will be really important. So I can just use the sponge roller now to go just like I'm painting on a wall and fill in the areas in between. I can take and use a brush. And again, stroke and coat generally takes three coats. So the thickened color that you did in the design, that basically is the equivalent of three coats. If you sponge color in between or you brush in between, you want to do two to three coats. Now I would generally do my stencils going all the way around on here that I want. I would do my thickener. I would do um, my, my glaze in there. I would do all of the black. And then once I have all of that done, I will go back and I will lift very gently my stencil. So you can see how you know, crisp the lines are on there using that thickener. I guarantee you if I had brushed or I had used a sponge dabber in there, I would have had color bleeding underneath all over the place. And and there's, I can see a couple little spots on there, but I'm not too concerned about that because I'm going to show you in a few minutes what we're going to do to disguise that. I forgot to bring a needle tool out here, so I'm just going to use a brush handle here. Normally I would use a needle tool or a toothpick 
to pick up the edge of the stencil. And I don't want to just yank this off because the color can kind of chip away if I do that. So I just kind of gently lift that stencil up and look at how cool and crisp that design comes out. How many of you have tried to use stencils and you've had color bleed under and it's very frustrating. And so I really like on very intricate designs, I really like to use that silk screen medium to thicken those colors. Now, I told you, if you do get some bleeding under, um, what I do is I take, to disguise that, I take a stiffer bristled fan brush. So this is like a hog bristle brush. There are um, brushes and products out there designed for doing speckling. And I'm going to just thin some of that black down a little bit. And I'm going to just have a little bit in the brush. I don't want to have this loaded up with color. And then I'm going to take my finger and I'm basically going to flick the bristles back toward the piece. So I'm going to hold it up this way. I'm going to bring my finger up and speckle over that design. And I'll, I'll lift this up so you guys can see the speckles on there. I'm not moving the brush back and forth. It's basically my finger pulling up and letting those bristles flick back to the surface. If you have too much color in the brush or too much water in the brush, so I kind of load it with color, and kind of blot it out a little bit, you'll get really big, giant speckles and sometimes big drips. So you want to be careful that you don't have too much color in that brush. Will the blue and yellow show up? Yep, so I'm going to hold this up, and you can see the blue and the yellow and the pink and um, what else did I use there? Blue, yellow, pink, and cantaloupe will show up in there. And those colors, they get, you know, a lot brighter once they're fired. The black gets shiny. The um, the cantaloupe and the yellow will be very bright. The blue will be very rich in color. So um, you can see the little, the little speckles in there. So again, mm -hmm. if you get a little bleeding under somewhere, don't try to go back and chisel that color away because then you're going to wash away your background color, okay? So that's doing the thickening technique. And again, I would do this whole piece, but we could be here all night. And I'm sure some of you would love to sit and watch me do that all night long, but that's doing that thickening technique. Now, um, on the rock, I'm going to show you guys using the spatula. And I've got another <clears throat> spatula here. And so we're going to use Mako Sculpting Medium. This is a fired product. This is their SG501. We just added this on our, our website today. And this is a real thick product. And when you open it, there's usually a little bit of fluid on the top. You need to really mix that well. It's a thick, um, almost like Cool Whip consistency, I guess you'd say, or like almost like drywall compound. And you want to really mix that fluid in. You don't want... Um, to work off of the top and use that fluid color. So make sure that you mix it really well and make sure that it's all blended. And we're going to use the new wheat stencil. I haven't even, I didn't even have a chance to um, use that new wheat stencil. It's been sitting here and I had intended on getting something done using the sculpting medium. Mm -hmm. So tonight will be the first time that that stencil gets used. And that's a a brand new stencil comes in a six inch size. And I think for those of you who've done workshops with me doing Raku, some of those samples that I showed uh, earlier today and over the last week have been um, Raku pieces. And so that like the stones that you saw with that forest scene on it, that was actually done using um, Raku glaze and doing a Raku fight ring. And on that one, I did, I've done it a couple different ways. I've done it where um, I've thickened the color like we just did using the Raku glaze, and I've done with the sponge rollers depending on the, the design that is used. So I'm going to pick up the sculpting medium. Again, I want to make sure that my stencil is down nice and flat, and I'm just going to take that and I'm going to drag it over the top of the design. And I usually kind of start in the middle and work my way out holding the stencil down and I'm scraping across the top so that the color is forced into the openings of 
the design. What was the cone you compared the sculpting media at? This is, I'm working on um, an earthenware piece, and so this is going to be fired to cone 06, just like a, a glaze firing. And I'm going to look on the label here because I think this will, Mako usually has on their labels, they'll have on there what happens if you fire it to a higher temperature. Um, and this one says cone 6 results, turns glossy. So generally this product is kind of matte. It's not real shiny. It's got more of a, a matte finish to it. So if you take it up to a cone six, a stoneware firing, you're going to get um, a, a glossier finish. Now you can also tint sculpting medium. And I usually, I don't mix color in with the sculpting medium because if you do mix color in with the sculpting medium, you can actually um, kind of break the color down and make it almost too fluid. And um, I don't like that. So if I wanted to add color to this, I could add stroke and coat on top of it. Someone just asked that. Oh, and I would, add stroke and coat? <laughs> yeah, and so I would like sponge it on top or um, brush it over the top before I remove the stencil. I'm gonna lift this up and hopefully we've got I did get, I was worried up on the top here, the stencil lifted a little. No, actually, I purposely did that so you guys could see. But look at how intricate that weed is. Now up here, as I was going over that, when I turned it, the stencil did lift a little bit, and I did get some, some bleeding under. So what I can do with this is I can let this dry, and once it's, or not completely dry while it's damp, but that shiny wet look is gone, I could go back with a needle tool or a toothpick and I could kind of remove some of that sculpting medium. And so that's why it's really important to make sure that you're always kind of holding the stencil down in those areas. But look at how simple mm -hmm. that is to do using a thicker product. And the sculpting medium usually dries really fast too. So that's kind of cool. So if I wanted now, I was talking a little bit about the color on here. If I had wanted to add color to my wheat, I think black with white on top is going to be really cool. But say I wanted to have kind of a, a gradient from a darker brown or a darker tan to, you know, more of a light tan or almost a yellow color on there. I could have taken a sponge and dabbed that on top of it because the sculpting medium had already filled in the stencil. I didn't have to worry about that color necessarily bleeding under. So I could sponge it on, I could roll that on, um, and then remove the stencil um, on there. The other thing is if you've got something that like this is a really intricate design that we did. Um, if you've got something that has bigger openings on it and, and you've got a lot of sculpting medium in there, make sure that the color kind of sets up. It doesn't need to be completely dry, but if you lift the stencil too soon and there's a lot of product mm -hmm. on there, it can, it can bleed together a little bit. So make sure the color is fairly thick before you, you lift or thickened and kind of set up on there before you lift the stencil. But don't wait for it to dry completely because if you wait for it to dry completely, you will have chunks of it um, chipping off on there as well. There's a few questions. Okay. Um, okay, so is stroke and coat an underglaze? Yeah, well. Can you tint it with underglaze? Yeah, and so stroke and coat is, it's called an underglaze, but it's technically a glaze. Well, someone just wants to know if you can tint it with underglaze. You can, you can put color on top of it. I don't recommend, and I don't think Mako recommends on their label. Um, I'm just looking to see. If they say anything on there, over yeah, apply stroke and coat over sculpting medium to add color. So if you start adding color, if you took some of this, put it on a tile or put it in a bowl and started adding product like stroke and coat to it, um, even things like color concentrates, color concentrate would probably be safer to add than stroke and coat because it's not a fritted mm -hmm. product. But um, it still could change that that color, the makeup of the color. So, um, and if you added a lot of stroke and coat to it, that color could kind of bleed out and bleed together. It wouldn't stay as dimensional. So I really, they don't recommend adding color to that. 
Okay. That camera's so driving me might crazy. Be a crazy question, but if you were doing a cup, could you use like painter's tape to hold the stencil in place, or would that pull off the base coat? No, that's a good question. Could you use painter's tape on the stencil if you're doing a cup? Did they say? Um, and and that you could do that. And so let's say, let me grab the wheat stencil here. I'm stacking these all up here to to wash off after. So if I had the wheat stencil and I was going to wrap this around this piece, I could tape it down. If this was a mug, I could tape it down. But again, you want to look for anywhere that it pops up. And this is actually a really good one to use on a mug because it doesn't have big areas that stick out. They're just a lot of small openings. So that actually would work well. Yeah. On something like the butterfly where it doesn't have... The heck is going... Oh, <laughs> I just set this down and hit the mouse pad on there and pop something up over my screen here. Um, on here, it would be hard to tape this down just because you don't have that extra plastic around the edges on these designs. Um, okay, is there a back and a front to the stencil or does it matter? Nope, doesn't matter. No back, no front. You can use either side. So if you want the butterfly this way and you want it that way, you can flip flop them. Just make sure, obviously, you wash it off in between. Okay, and then... Um, you did all that pretty watercolor background, but then you spread the black outside the stencil. Are the colors going to be able to come through all of that black that's on the outside of the stencil? No, so this is purposely, I just want the color showing where the stencil is. So I will continue this piece and add more stencils around the outside of this, but it's going to cover most of it with you black. Want it to be black otherwise. Right, and I want it to be black otherwise and just have the color where the stencil is. Okay, and then um, what is the advantage of using that medium versus a silk screen medium? So this medium, the sculpting medium, is all pre-mixed, and it's white. And that's something else I just wanted to mention, too, that I thought of as I was talking about mixing color with it. If you mixed color with this, this is white, so it's going to lighten any color that you w would add to it. But I really don't recommend, and Mako doesn't recommend adding color to it. But this is a white dimensional product, and this will give you dimension. So the thicker you put the sculpting medium on, the more dimensional it will be. On this piece, you're really not going to have dimension on there because it's not as thick as the sculpting medium. Sculpting media food it is not. This is not recommended, and I'll, I'll read that on the label too. Um, fire to shelf cone 0506, not suitable for dinnerware due to surface characteristics. And so because this is kind of a matte product, um, and it's more matte than a matte glaze, um, it, it isn't designed for food surfaces, plus it's dimensional, and so food could get caught in between areas too, and bacteria can form. So that's a good question if it's food safe. Yeah, I, this is really, it's, oh. it's driving me nuts that it's, it's doing that. But Someone asked if the stencils are reusable, and someone else commented. Yes, yep, absolutely. Just yep, just wash them off. And so I'll take these back, and on the sink I've got the, <laughs> you know, you can push the button on the, the faucet that'll turn it into a sprayer, or if you have a, the hose sprayer on there, that I find best. Um, be careful, like, using a sponge and rubbing over it. I'll usually use that sprayer. We'll get most of the color off. If I get an area where there's color on there, I may take my thumb or my finger and kind of rub over it. But be careful using sponges or scrubbing on them because it can catch some of those little intricate pieces on there. All right. We've got our other stone here with the the background. So this stone you guys probably saw some pieces where I had um, the raku on the the, the pieces, um, the the forest scene on there. So when you're doing raku, um, you don't need to do any background color. And anywhere that you don't have color on the piece where you don't have raku glaze and it's bare bisque it will turn black in the raku process. So when these pieces, when the raku pieces are taken out of the kiln, they're put in a trash can with combustibles, the paper starts on fire, and then you put the lid on and it smothers the fire and there's all the smoke inside there that penetrates the bisque and turns it kind of a grayish black color. So I'll post some of those pictures into the comments tonight after our live to show you the raku pieces and that's how those are done. On this one, I did the background using the color concentrates. And if I did color concentrates on the background of this, 
and I did my stencil with Raku glaze, and then I did a Raku firing on this, these colors, because they're not fritted and they don't fire out shiny, would turn grayish black and you wouldn't see these colors. If you want to do Raku with a colorful background like this, I recommend doing either the, the background with like stroking coat, or if you use these, put a couple coats of clear glaze over it before you do your Raku glaze and make sure that your clear glaze isn't an old leaded glaze that's going to run and flow. You want to have it so that um, the, the glaze that you put on top of it, then the Raku glaze, you don't want that running and flowing on the piece. All right, any other questions? Someone asked if something was similar to the colors for Earth Dimensions, and Paula said, I don't think so. That looks like a glaze-based product. But um, not, I wasn't sure what they were talking about. So, it, yeah, I think they might be asking if she has something that's similar to the... She, the, she just said, is it similar? And I, I, okay. I asked her, if, I don't know if she meant the media or... <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm not sure either what... And then one other quick, um, can you clear coat the sculpt in media? Um... You can, you can clear coat it, but it doesn't necessarily make it food safe if you do that. And it's so on, on this piece, that's why I did stroke and coat in the background, or I could do a non flowing gloss glaze or matte glaze in the background, so I don't need to do a glaze over the top of it. I like the contrast of the glossy against the matte of the, the sculpting medium. Actually, Paula does have, now that I think about it, she has a dimensional paste that can said, be fired. She just said it looks like a glaze-based product. Yeah. Colors for Earth are clay-based. Right. But, Paula, you have a, that um, that dimensional paste that can be fired and not fired. I'm wondering oh, if that would... she was asking about the Mako Sculpting Medium. Yeah, and the Mako Sculpting Medium is a, a glaze base. It's like okay. a, a thick matte glaze, basically, I believe. Okay. All right, we got that. All right. So I'm putting out some more um, stroke and coat here, and I'm going to show you guys using um, a stencil larger stencil over this rock but it's time for a commercial break and i just i i don't have a lot of items tonight to show you guys but i'm just going to show you some of the stencils and so for those of you who've been in before you know that on the website learnfiredarts.com most of the products that i use are on there we have a section um that is the um live event specials and you'll find those and then we usually try to number most of those items and so this week because there were lots of different stencil options and there's 12 inch stencils and six inch stencils um, i just did all of the six inch stencils as number three all of the 12 inch stencils are number two so that they pop up as some of the first items on there so small stencils um, we've got um, a couple different butterfly stencils and I'm just going to go through these kind of quickly. This daisy one, I think, is a really cool design. Another butterfly that's a little bit different than the other one. We've got a dahlia uh, floral design. We've got a um, uh, daffodil. I couldn't think there for a minute. I was like, wait, what kind of flower? It's a daffodil design. And we've got the wheat and the six inch. So you'll find all of those on there. I think a couple of them are already out of. We've sold a lot of these in the last week. Um, but we will get some more in, so the website will just back order it, and we'll have more of those in next week. This is one of my favorites, so the, the large stencils, the 12-inch. Um, this is one of my favorites. I love this aspen tree design, um, and I'm debating if I want to do this on the rock or the forest scene. I think I'm actually going to do this one because I don't have any pieces done with that one. This one is kind of a fun, this is called fringe, and it's just kind of, so anywhere you see black is where your color will show up. Anywhere that you see white on here is the stencil. We've got this one too is, is one of my favorites. The tree, really popular one with Raku. This is similar to the stencil that was used in that big bowl that I showed at the beginning. We've got fish and underwater designs. We've got this one um, that I think is supposed to be, I think it's leafy texture. I always think it looks more like flames. 
We've got the dragonfly, and then this is the sunlit forest. This is the one that I'll post the picture of later that um, is, that I did with the raccoon technique. And this one, um, we're the only ones that have this in the 12-inch size. Um, we This was a, a special design that we ordered, and I think we've got probably about 50 of these left. Once they're gone, they're gone, and we won't be able to get that one any longer. So I'm going to do this aspen tree design on the rock. And, you know, a lot of people worry about the fact that their stencil is bigger than their piece. And that's fine. But I'm going to show you with a large square stencil like this, the reason I like to use these the rock is I can position the stencil any way that I want on here, depending how much of the top of the tree I want showing versus the bottom of the tree. Now, on a rounded bowl like this, a square stencil like this can be a little bit more challenging to get that pressed down around on the design because every time I push it down somewhere it bulges up somewhere else and so if you want to try to do something like this on a rounded shape or a, a concave shape like this it can really be a challenge because look at how it buckles up over here so it's just constantly going along and holding it down you almost need a second person to do that so flat surfaces with these or the outside of a vase, this would work well working your way around. So pay attention to the shape and your stencil and just, you know, practice bending the stencil to see what happens before you um, decide to use it on a particular shape. So this one, I'm going to kind of center this over the rock. So I've got a good portion of the top of the trees showing. I'm going to slide this up a little bit and this is where I'm going to use the sponge roller and show you how this works so on a very flat surface the sponge roller will work I've got some bigger spaces some smaller spaces in this design and I want to make sure now that I have this roller loaded really well and you can see this wet glob of color that's on that sponge roller I don't want to see that because if I start rolling that on the piece I guarantee you you're going to be pushing color underneath the design on there. So once I have the sponge completely saturated with color, I don't see any light areas on there, then um, I take it and I pull just toward myself. And so I'm touching it down, pulling toward myself, touching down and pulling. And I do that, I don't know how many times, 30 times um, to make sure that that color is really worked into that sponge. I don't want to start rolling over the top of this and have color oozing out. So I'm applying a little bit of pressure as I do that to make sure that that color is evenly distributed. If I see shiny globs of color on there, I need to work it in more. And that is the biggest thing in workshops is people, they roll two or three times and then they start going on there and they force color underneath their design. So again, I'm going to kind of hold this down with a couple of fingers and I'm going to start rolling over the top of the stencil and the reason I like this versus like a sponge dabber is that dabber people are going like this and they're forcing it and they tend to put too much pressure on it and they end up um, forcing color underneath that stencil design now I used stroke and coat with this um, Paula's color concentrates work really well for this because you can put one coat on and because they are so concentrated one coat will give you nice solid even coverage and you don't need to go over it multiple times someone thought you had doily or lacy looking stencil but they can't find it as it discontinued um there have been over the years i've had a lot of different stencils and i find that after a while everybody has the design and then um, it just doesn't sell anymore so I try to change the designs out but yeah there's nothing um, lacy or doily at this point that I can think of the the closest would be that Rosetta design can you do this on greenware you can do this on greenware using um, things like the color concentrates um, Mako says you can use stroke and coat on greenware. I just want to show you guys while I'm doing this. So I put a puddle of color out there. I don't need all of that to fill the sponge, so I'm kind of working next to that 
puddle and leaving that. Um, you just have to remember when you're you're working on greenware though that it's greenware. And so when I do workshops, rarely do I ever work with greenware because um, people have a tendency to forget they're working with greenware and they put too much pressure on their pieces and then they break them and that can be very disappointing um, when you've worked on a piece for a long time. You have those sponge rollers for sale, right? Yep, the sponge rollers are on there. And I didn't assign an item number to it. There isn't a whole lot in the live event specials right now. Oh, she said she can't find them. Um, they should be under the, the live event specials, or um, you will find them under the brushes and tools. Some items are under multiple different categories. So I'm rolling over this a couple more times with color to make sure that I get nice coverage. Again, I'm not applying a ton of pressure because I don't want to force that color underneath. And then I can take and lift that up and I've got my cool tree design with the colors all showing through in the background. Now let's say I missed some spots or the color didn't go through on some of those little um, lines in the trees for the bark on there. I can always go back with a brush, pick up some of that color and add some details or um, if I need to fill in somewhere with color, I can do that as well. All right. On the background of this rock, I'll probably do some washes of color and add some darker colors around that background as well. I can also take and do some speckling on here as well. So I'll get my stiff fan brush. And I'll pick up a little bit of that color, add a little bit of water to thin it. And there are splatter brushes out there too. Um, some people are like, oh, I use a toothbrush to do my splattering. And, and that's great, but I work for a brush company. Mm -hmm. And so we don't sell toothbrushes. So stiff bristled fan brushes um, work really well. But I can do a little bit of a speckling on here as well. Speckles cover up a lot of mistakes. And you know, sometimes you get, you'll clear glaze something and you'll get that goofy little dark speck somewhere that you're, you're not expecting it. All right. Now this piece, the, the stroke and coat might be heavy enough that it'll fire out glossy, but the color concentrates in the background. We made a watercolor wash and I had mentioned that they're not a fruited product, so they won't fire out shiny. So if I want them to be shiny, I need to do a clear glaze over this. It's okay to put clear glaze over the stroke and coat and you would, would clear glaze the whole thing. If you want a really interesting contrast, just fire it this way, finish your background down there, fire it this way and you'll get a really matte color in the background and then you'll get a nice glossy finish where the black is on there. I do recommend, this isn't obviously a dinnerware piece that anybody's gonna eat off of. I do recommend putting a brush on sealer to seal that surface in the background so that somebody with oil on their hands or dirt on their hands, because that um, color concentrate doesn't fire out shiny, so it's gonna be like bisque, and putting a sealer over it will protect that. Any other? Here, I'll hold up your phone and... Well, I, I just was going to share oh. it to post it. Oh, okay. You know how you can, like, some people provide a link to, like... Yeah, so, and we can put a, a link in there. So if you're, did you find it under the live event specials? Or was it under... If, if you're having trouble finding that, just type in in the search box, RD411, and it should bring it up in a search. But that's the, the sponge rollers on the website. Janine's got a computer going, she's got her phone going... <laughs> Oh, I'm you guys, I have something <laughs> really exciting to share with you. Janine got a job promotion here. Um, last night, she learned how to do labels with USPS and FedEx, and she printed out all of the labels for today. Um, so we need to come up with a title for her. So if you guys can work on what her title should be in the company, because I, I did, what, did we double your pay or what did we do? Yeah. Yeah, we doubled her her pay, so um, so she's still not getting anything. 
All right. So I'm going to show you guys some other samples here. So I talked about the Spectre Clear and somebody was asking in the beginning. This was one of the pieces that we did in the underglaze um, curving um, live that we did. And so this has the black and it has the Spectre Clear. And you can see as I turn that, how that, that sparkles on there. So the Spectre Clear comes in pint sizes and it also comes in four ounce sizes. And so the Stardust, the SG701 I've got on the website, this one is the one that's got the glittery sparkle to it. They also have in the Spectre Clear line, they have Celebration, they have Peppermint, and they have Autumn. So the Autumn has kind of orange and brown specks in it. It's basically a clear glaze with speckles. And so there's like orange and brown in that one. Um, the Peppermint has uh, red and green specks in it. And then the Celebration has, I think, like blues and purples and yellows and maybe some pink little specks. And you can kind of see in the bottom of the bottle, it's different than a crystal glaze. Crystal glazes have the large chunks of crystal in the bottom. These just have, it's like a little, like a little piece of sand. It almost feels like in there. So you want to make sure that you shake these really well and mix them before you apply them. Um, we will be adding, we just brought in the, the rest of the colors, the Stardust. The sparkly one, we've got on the website new products. We've got all of the um, uh, Spectre Clear colors in. And you can use these anywhere that you would use clear glaze, but it'll add the speckle to it as well. The Spectre Clear, I think I mentioned earlier, works best on dark colors. So on black, dark blue, dark browns, um, it shows up much better on both surfaces and so we have these all in pints and four ounce bottles on the website we will be adding a kit i forgot to do it today we'll be adding a kit that has all four colors in the pints and all four colors in the four ounce we'll be adding to the website as well well ruth found the rollers now she's looking for the glazes <laughs> oh okay <laughs> I hope you're paying attention, Ruth, and listening while you're doing that, too. Um, so we do have some color kits you'll see on there, too, and I didn't number these. Um, they're under the live event specials. Um, we have the, the color concentrates. We sell them in kits. There's three different kits. If you buy all three kits, you get all of the colors that, that they have. The kit number one is the most popular kit that has kind of your basic colors in there. Um, we also will be adding all of the colors individually. We haven't had a chance to do that, but we do have the black in two ounce and one ounce um, up there on the website. Those are under the, the live event specials as well. Um, and you'll be seeing all of the individual colors. We have them all in stock. We'll be adding those to the site. Okay, there's a couple questions that, that I missed before. I tried to answer this one about, someone asked about using the media mixed with color or underglaze on greenware and I said I thought you had said it was advisable not to mix it but they said she said I'm talking about the silk screen media can it put, be put on greenware because it's mixed with underglaze yeah if you mix it with a clay based underglaze so if you take like Mako's UG underglazes and you mix a silk screen medium with it and you thicken it and you put it on greenware my concern would be, <clears throat> okay, your greenware is dry. You're mixing and you're thickening that underglaze and you're putting that on there. What's going to happen is that underglaze is going to shrink as it dries. And I'm afraid it might crack in areas or it might lift and pull back on there. So I'm not sure. I, I haven't tried that. That's a really good question. I haven't tried that, but I think the underglaze is they're probably going to get some cracks in because you're going to be putting them on pretty thick if you mix them with the silk screen medium. Um, I was using stroke and coat on bisque. Um, I, again, I just I worry about people working on greenware. And if you're just doing it yourself, I'm sure you feel comfortable doing that. I always look at it from a workshop perspective of people in the class breaking their pieces. Can you use a dark color under and a light color on top? Yeah, that's a good question. Can you use a dark color under and a light color on top? So if I did a piece with black on the background and I could use the color concentrates, I could use stroke and coat on the background, um, 
although the, the color concentrates I wouldn't do on a big area in Paula. You can jump in if you feel differently about it. Um, but I wouldn't try to do really big areas with color concentrates. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can use thickened color over the top of it. And, you know, if it's the equivalent of three coats, so if you're using stroke and coat, and you mix that with the silk screen medium, and you do that over the top, they will block out the colors below. But as you're rubbing over that stencil, if you find that you're rubbing the color on, and you can still see the dark color in the background, rub a little bit more on there because you wanna make sure that you block that out. If you get a real thin area that's the equivalent of one, one coat of stroke and coat, um, it can be kind of translucent and that dark color will show through. Can you put the stencil on a slab and then put it on a GR pottery form? Um, okay, so if you put the stencil on a slab, so you're working with a wet slab of clay, you can. Um, but here's the thing. if if so, so those of you that aren't familiar with the GR pottery forms, they're kind of a wood material, mm -hmm. and they're they're like for bowls and different shapes. And you basically roll out a slab of clay. And so I could roll out a slab of clay. I could take that stencil, we'll pretend that this is a, a slab of clay, and I could take that stencil and I could put that on there and I could roll over it and kind of press that stencil into it. Um, I could do color over the top of it right on the raw clay, um, but remember the, the clay won't soak up the color as well as dry a dry piece would, so you need to lay it on kind of heavy. You could let that dry, but not completely dry, um, and it's recommended like putting a plastic bag underneath your slab of clay so your clay slab doesn't dry out because it'll take a while for that wet color to dry on top of the clay. Um, if I then take this and I lay this over the top of a form and I form it around, you know, the bowl or whatever shape it is, the stencil, depending on the design, like this is pretty flexible. This will flex well with the clay. But if I take that rectangular stencil and I try to form this around a bowl this is going to want to bend and it's probably going to damage it and it, it won't form real good around the bowl so you would need a stencil that's got a real intricate design what I would probably do though is I would do my color I would let a, a coat of that dry I would lay this on top so if I do my background colors let that dry lay this on top kind of roll it in brush roll um, some color over the top of it remove the stencil, let that color dry, and then put that over the top of that form and form it around there very gently so that you don't disturb the color on there. You might even put a piece of plastic over it before you put it on that form so that the form doesn't cut into it and remove any of that color. I kind of fell behind, but maybe you know what she's asking. Can you put clear glaze over that? Clear glaze over that. Meant, like, um, <laughs> is it like at a certain point where that was, it was asked? Like eight minutes ago, so okay, so then, at that point, I probably I might have been working on the rock, and she was, was asking before you told them about my um, your raise. Okay, so it might have been around the rock time, and yeah, you can clear glaze over the top of that if that was what that was in relation to. Do you have the stroke and coats and two ounce kits? I do, and that's what I had just set these okay. out here and then started right. answering questions. Sorry. No, that's all right. All right, I think. I think I remember what it is. Okay. Or do you fire those colors? I don't know which one. So all of the colors that I'm working with tonight do get fired. Okay. And so whether you're okay. using them on stoneware surfaces, Paula's colors can also be high fired, and she's got a little chart that shows how they come out. Mako also has charts that show how their colors are affected um, in, in firing. And remarkably, things like reds and oranges fire out beautifully to a high fire color. Okay, and then, oops, what one was used on the Christmas trees? On the Christmas trees with the Spectaclear, that is a, a, a whole different live event, oh. I think, and that was I don't think I've even which got that one? tree. Which one used on the Christmas so on that Christmas tree, that blue Christmas tree, if that's the one you're talking about, that was done using the um, night blue Mako UG underglaze. I don't know the number offhand, actually. Nope. I'm just looking up on the shelf here if I have one sitting here, and I don't. 
Um, it's a, a UG night blue that was used on there. And then we use the wax resist. And then we use the Spectaclear Stardust, the one that's got the speckle in it, did that. And then it repelled where the wax was. And then we did Mother of Pearl over the top of that as well. Okay. And then someone wants to know if you have a stroking coat in the pint kits. And someone said how much are... Oh, someone said the speckle colors. So yeah, about. so I'm, I'm going to talk about the, and then the different colors. They asked how much things are, so you're probably going to get okay. that now. Okay, so Stroke and Coat comes in pint sizes I carry. We have kits that have 12 pints of color. There are three different kits of the pints, and then there are three different kits. I just have the one kit and the three kit out here. They all come with different color combinations. Um, these are the two ounce bottles. And these are on special, I don't have the pricing in front of me, about $39 to $40 for 12 bottles of this. The pints, I honestly can't remember how much they were, but they're all um, on the, the website. And then we will be adding all the open stock of these colors as well. Mako does have speckled stroke and coat. So there, there are stroke and coat colors that are solid color with different color specs inside of them. I don't recommend using those with stencils. And the reason I don't is because those specs are kind of dimensional on there. And if you do a background with one of those and you try to lay that stencil down on there where those little bumps are, your stencil is going to want to be raised up in those areas and you're going to get more bleeding of color underneath there. Um, and if you use that, if you use the speckled colors to thicken and rub them on, it's going to be like your finger is working over sandpaper and it's probably going to make your finger a little sore. Um, and I also worry about those specks kind of forcing their way under as you're rubbing that on there. So I would avoid the speckled stroke and coat, um, even rolling it on with the, the sponge. Um, mm, that was the ones that the speckle colors were the ones that someone was asking about if you fire. You used me. She said that was what I was thinking. Oh, the was glazes. The yeah, so these, these speckled, the stardust and the, the speckled, the spectaclears, <clears throat> those are all a clear glaze that get fired that have those specks in it. Yeah, yeah, okay. those do get fired. And those two will go to um, higher temperatures. Um, they do, like the specks in the spectaclear turns a little bit more brown on light colors instead of being a black speck. All right. Okay. She thinks she's got all the questions. All right. So you'll see the stroke and coat kits. You'll see the colors for earth kits. You'll see the stencils. You'll see the sponge rollers. You'll see um, uh, you'll see all kinds of cool stuff on the website. So go in and shop. Last week we had the most incredible week ever. A lot of you were, might have been in the, the Clay Share Con. Um, between that and our, our live webinar, I have a stack of orders that's about that high yet that we have to pull and ship. And so um, we're not trying to push a lot of stuff tonight because we've got a lot of orders to, to fill already. So, um, and I appreciate everybody's support with that. So anybody looking for the mystery box? I'm going to bring that up here. And Janine's got the, the names inside. And what we're going to be doing from now on with the mystery box is, um, because it, it gets a little out of hand when we have a couple hundred people in here, of people wanting to be included with the mystery box, and we get people that come in really late and want to be included. So we're going to limit it to the first 50 people from now on. Once we go live, we want to encourage everybody to get in right at the beginning of the live show that we're doing and say mystery box and so the first 50 people tonight janine wrote their names down and we've got their names in a bowl here and we're going to draw a name out i'm going to mix them up here well i really got to get a bigger bowl for this every week i have this little bowl out here all right so we're going to not looking Judy Kerr. All right, so I'm going to open the mystery box and we'll show what's inside. Judy, if you're still in here, put in a message that you're still here. And once I show what's in the box, let us know if you want this box. And if you don't, we will draw another name out. So I told you guys the box is full of a lot of new stuff. We've got some brand new stamps. These aren't on the website yet. Some really new, uh, cool new stamp designs that are different from the ones that we have. 
There's three brand new stamps. These will be getting put up this week. Um, we just added back the clay sculpting tools. Some of you took advantage of this last week. Um, these are great for doing um, textures and things in your clay sculpting and, and doing designs in the clay. This little spoolie tool, this was designed for cleaning greenware, for getting into tight spots, and, and, and you just kind of drag the tool back and forth to get into tight areas. Um, but it's also great for those of you who do Christmas trees and you get glaze in those holes and you need to clean the holes out where those lights go. There's a wider end and there's a real narrow end at the, at the other end on there. Those work great for cleaning out holes and also for cleaning greenware. We got a set of the, the pastel chalks. These are a non-fired finish. We're going to be doing a live on this coming up soon. Um, this has 36 different colors in here, and I'm going to show you guys how to use chalks. And you can use these in combination with stains like the softy stains and things that we sell. We're going to be adding the Duncan acrylic line soon. A lot of you took advantage of the... Um, kits that we did with the Mako Softy acrylic colors. We're going to be doing the same thing with Duncan. Now Mako um, purchased the Duncan color line and they are in the process um, every week they update us on what colors are available and there's still a handful of the Duncan stains that aren't available. Once they're all available we'll be adding those um, with the, the kits. In here also is um, a set of the new um, dry brush set of the big kids brushes. Um, these are actually really good brushes, acrylic handles. We've got a set of the, the kids little colorful brushes in here. These two acrylic handles, gold tack line. They're actually a really decent brush and there's nice little assortment of sizes in there. We've got the gold tack line, the clear choice brush assortment. This has 24 different brushes, rounds and flats. There are um, multiple different sizes in here. There's four each of six different brushes, three rounds and three flats in this assortment. Really good um, set of brushes. We just um, are going to be adding some new large sea wool sponges. We're doing a lot of techniques with wax and things, and so we're adding um, a nice large natural sea wool sponge. Um, we just found out today we're going to be getting, for those of you that throw on the wheel, we're going to be getting the nice thick um, uh, elephant ear sponges are back. There was a disease that hit the ocean a few years ago and killed off a lot of those sponges and um, they're back to being able to um, harvest those sponges again and we'll be getting those in soon. Mermaid brushes, these are a cool set. These are really good for fired finishes. It's got soft hair. The unicorn brushes have gold taclon hair, perfect for acrylics and stain finishes. Take okay, good. And then we've got a set of the sponge rollers. And those also work with the stamps, Judy. If you look back, I did a live event doing um, stamping. If You you might have been in there for that one. I can't remember. Um, but they, the sponge rollers work great with the stamps. I also have in here two of the Moderna brushes. So when I did the eye workshop, we had the 10-0 the um liner brush that we use for the eyes and I had some people that asked do you have anything that's even finer than that so I'm going to pull the the caps off of these to show you hopefully this will show up the the 20 ot brush my hands really filthy with paint here is even you know what I'll do it on a white surface that'll show up better um, is even finer than than the the 10 odds so there's one of each of those brushes in there too and these are both up on the website individually or um as the the one that the 10 at comes with the eye painting kit so that's what judy got in her box tonight and we will ship that out to you judy you can go into the learn fired arts and item number one under the um event specials is pay by dollar amount and it's basically set up as a $1 item, and you just change the quantity to 50, enter your information in there, and we will get that box shipped out to you. All right, so I'm gonna flip this up here. I think Janine's just looking through to see if there are any other questions that have popped up. 
um, but we'll give her a minute there. She's kind of shaking her head no. Did you guys come up with a title for her for her big promotion? Oh, all sorts of. Oh, all sorts of. All right, I'll, I'll look. I'll look through and, and take a look at those mm-hmm. later. So I'll pop some pictures in there of some of the pieces that I talked about tonight. And um, I appreciate you guys joining us tonight. If you have other questions, send me a message and I'll try to answer. Or if you post it to um, the, the video chat, I try to get through there and I get notifications. If you don't hear from me within a couple days, if you post something in there, um, just send me a private message because sometimes I get so many notifications. Last week between Facebook notifications and emails, I had over a thousand messages that had come in. So I was kind of just like going back and forth, constantly dealing with that. So um, thanks for joining us tonight. I hope everybody has a great week. Um, In uh, the end of this month, um, we, I hate to tell you guys, we're not gonna have a live event on, is it the 30th or 31st? Whatever that Wednesday is, the last Wednesday of the month. Yeah, it's the 31st. We're going to go on vacation, so I'm warning you guys already. You can plan something for that Wednesday night. three more weeks. So three more weeks of stuff. I'm not even sure next week what I'm going to do. If I'm going to do chalks, um, if I'm going to do dry brushing. Um, I try to go back and forth between clay and painting techniques every other week. Um, Right now, we are so far behind on clay puzzling molds that I, I almost fear offering anything else with clay that might be using the clay puzzling mold. So I'll post something later this week or this weekend on what we're going to do next week. But I got tons of different techniques and stuff that we can do. So thanks for joining us tonight. And I look forward to seeing everybody next week.